हैं अपने अगले सत्र की ओर आर्किटेक्चर्स ऑफ ट्रांसग्रेशन ऑन राइटिंग डिजायर इज आर नेक्स्ट सेशन थ्री राइटर्स इन इंग्लिश एक्सप्लोर द एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ डिजायर इन राइटिंग थ्रू रीडिंग्स फ्रॉम द लेटेस्ट वर्क एंड अ क्लोज कॉन्वर्सेशन फॉर दिस सेशन प्लीज ज्वाइन मी इन वेलकमिंग मार्गरेट मास्करेनस is a multilingual and transna transnational writer consulting editor and independent curator with a background in comparative literature she is the author of the widely acclaimed diasporic novel skin her second novel the disappearance of irene dos santos was a barnes and noble discovery pick in literary fiction she was the founding director of sunapranta goa center of the arts and blue shores prison art project at the central jail aguada in goa Please join me in welcoming her. Rosalind De Mello is a widely published freelance art writer based in New Delhi. Her debut non-fiction title, A Handbook for My Lover, will be released in November 2015. Her art reviews and features have been published in Art Plus Auction, Modern Painters, Passages, Art India and Take on Art. She is a regular contributor to Vogue, Open, Mint Lounge, Art Review and Art Review Asia. She was the associate editor for the Art Critic, a selection of the art writings of Richard Bartholomew. She was nominated for Forbes Best Emerging Art Writer Award and the inaugural Potential Eye Art Award for Best Writing on Asian Contemporary Art in 2014. Please join me in welcoming her. <laughs> Sudeep Sen is a poet whose works have been translated into over 25 languages his collections include postmarked india new and selected poems rain arya which won the ak ramanujan translation award ladakh and the harper collins book of english poetry his collection blue new new poems and ekphrases has already won george zalamia international poetry prize he is the first asian to participate at the nobel laureate week where he delivered the Derek Walcott lecture and read from his work Fractals new and selected poems please join me in welcoming him okay it's a good to be closer to the crowd which is fabulously populous <laughs> and off these main lights so because uh, the 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 uh, topic is on desire transgression pot body politics and so on so my poems i'm going to read uh to do with that obviously this is a very very old poem um called woman of a thousand fires this actually belongs to my first book which came out in 1990 and um it arose from a, a piece of research i was reading which is a, a particular uh, tribal group in um in south america if a woman there is found to be barren she is expected to go through this strange sort of sexual um, rituals before she kills herself and uh, it the first two lines are simply an epigraph from the uh, from the report woman of a thousand fires i am made of silence my words fall at my feet In the windy courtyard where my house once stood I labor heavy stone slabs carrying them in circles I'm falling the moon is pulling at me as everything swirls I hear the crickets hum craving in dizzy notes until I drop a stone in the empty well and hollowness echoes and murmurs swinging savaging the chicken I peel every feather plume by plume I caress your breasts you coy quiver tenuously the ritual bleeds snapping the umbilical cord amid wailing hounds while whispers whistle the barren reeds the broom sweeps the brown landscape as time collects in black mirrors adorned you mythic a red fly in your hair the mask dance chants and again charged moans breathe as wind whispers through fiery reeds i hear the world go round but i'll wait till the gale passes as you wait for me 
wearing black. This one's called Offering. And it's partly about the act of writing on a body. Offering. The kindness of libation, lyric, and blood. Her endless notes left for me little secrets, graces, trills recorded on blue and purple parchment to be lipped, tasted, devoured. Only the essence remains its tickiness, its juice, its memory. Seamless juxtaposition, the brute and the passion, dry of the bone and wet of the sea, coarseness of the page and smooth of the smooth of the nib's iridium, I try and trace a line, a very long line. The ink blots as this line's linear edge dissolves and frays, like capillary threads gone mad, twirling in the deep heat of the tropics. Threads unraveling, each sinew tense with the want of moisture and the other's flesh. There are no endings here only beginnings, precious incipients, translucent drops of sweat perched precariously on a collarbone, waiting to slide, roll unannounced into the gullies that yearn to soak in the rain. Heartbeats shift the shape of globules as they alter their balance and color, changing their very point of gravity, constantly deceiving the other. I stand wanting, wanting more of the bone's dry edge, the infinite blur of desire, the dream, the wet, the salt, the ink, and the underside of her skin. This is a poem about cooking. It's, uh, I think this is the time for gajar ka halwa. So this poem actually details the recipe of how to cook gajar ka halwa. So if you follow this, you can get a pretty cracking piece of dessert. Uh, it's called Indian Dessert. And it's part of a series of 16 poems I wrote um, called Lines of Desire, 16 Movements on Erotica. And initially, it was prompted by the fact that here we are in 2015. I wrote this a couple of years ago. Um, we are from a culture where the erotic is celebrated in such fine refinement. We have uh, brilliant Sangam poetry, Tamil poetry uh, about the subject, the sculptures of Khajura. And we are completely becoming regressive day by day. Of course, I mean, I, my head might be chopped by Narendra Modi if I read this, but hey. You know, as an act of dissent, I'm going to do this. Indian dessert. Clumps of wet smoke simmer in the pan and slowly lift to caress the outline of your breasts as you cook, stirring spices in carrot, milk, and cream. Ingredients that conjure recipes of hunger and passion. As you melt sugar and butter and gently stroke flakes of grated almond shavings, more clumps of perfume smoke permeate through the silk of your shirt, now transparent in heat, painting the outer circles of the nipples to an hardened edge, tasting the sweet skin, the sweet surface of the crinkled base to a creamed mouthful of untampered delicacy. This is a little poem on film criticism. Remember Orson Welles' fantastic film, Citizen Kane, and the central image was the rosebud. So this is a real erotic critique of that. It's called Climax. Lips of a rosebud open, 
to let the dew drop in. And this is a poem on pollination and biology. These are not erotic poems, right? <laughs> Called Release. The stamen raises its head, bursting to shed pollen. Relief rain showers the parched folds of pink skin. An area that particularly interests me is classical music and dance. I grew up with, of course, North Indian classical music, but I had this wonderful uh, uh, privilege of spending a month in Kalakshetra when I was an undergrad student in Delhi on this thing called the Gurukul Scholarship. And uh, that month at Kalakshetra, Rukmani Arundel School was just absolutely life-changing as far as I was concerned. So this is a poem called Bharatanatyam Dancer. It's, uh, it's a poem from my, well, this is a poem I've written before, but I'm working on a book called The Whispering Anklet, which basically re each poem responds to a different dance form, Mohiniyatam, Kathak, uh, so on and so forth, including modern dance and jazz and ballet. And this is just one of them. The reason I'm reading it is, is because it fits the, fits the topic, and you'll know why. One of the things that also interests me is form and structure. So uh, normally, uh, when you watch a performance like you all are doing, this is an unusual stage, of course, but normally when you're watching a performance, you, you see us, the performers, with the X and the Y axis, the horizontal and the height, and you imagine the Z axis, which is the depth. What interested me was if I were to be the lights boy and was on top of the stage and thermal mapped the dancer's rehearsal steps, would, uh, what kind of patterning she would be making. And I did that f with this dancer. And the most extraordinary thing happened uh, when I saw the photographs I took, the patterning she was making on stage was exactly the tal and the bowl, ta dhin ta tai thai ta, ta dhin ta tai thai ta. So I said, why not then invent a rhyme scheme, A, B, A, C, C, A, A, B, A, C, C, A, for a poem by an Indian writing in English. And this is called Bharatanatyam Dancer, and it's dedicated to Leela Sampson. Spaces in the electric air divide themselves in circular rhythms as the slender grace of your arms and belt-tied ankles describe a geometric topography, real, cosmic, one that once reverberated continually in a prescribed courtyard of an ancient temple in South India. As your eyelids flit and flirt and match the subtle abhinay in a flutter of eyelashes, the pupils create an unusual focus, sight, only ciliary muscles blessed and cloaked in celestial kajal could possibly enact. The raw brightness of Kanjivaram silk of your breath and the nobility of antique silver adorns you and your dance, reminding us of the treasure chest that is only half exposed, disclosed just enough, barely, for art in its purest form, never reveals all. Even after the arc lights have long faded, the audience, now invisible, has stayed over. Here I can still see your pirouettes, frozen as time-lapse exposures. Feel the murmuring shadow of an accompanist's intricate rag in this theater of darkness a darkness where oblique memories of my Kalakshetra days filter, matching your very own of another time, where darkness itself is sleeping light, light that merges, reshapes, and ignites, dancing delicately in the half-light. But it is the sacred darkness that endures, melting light with desire, desire that simmers and sparks the radiance of your quiet femininity. As the female dancer now illuminates everything visible, clear, poetic, passionate, and ice pure. Sudeep.
I think we're be, running. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll just end with one little one. Um, and this is from the same series of the 16 poems. It's a short poem called Desire. Under the soft, translucent linen, the ridges around your nipples harden at the thought of my tongue. You, lying inverted like the letter C, arch yourself deliberately, wanting the warm press of my lips. It's wet to coat the skin that is bristling, burning, breaking into sweats of desire, sweet juices of imagination. But in fact, I haven't even touched you, at least not yet. Um, I have two works in progress, or one is just finished and one is in progress. One is uh, uh, an essay and combination with fiction piece uh, for a new publication by Hardy Grant. Uh, it's an anthology of, of Indian women writers and it's called uh, Walking Towards Ourselves, Indian Women Tell Their Stories. Margaret, uh, would be, be louder. Louder? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Did you hear the title? Walking Towards Ourselves, Indian Women Tell Their Stories by Hardy Grantit, which will be out in January this year at JLF, I think. Um, I, in my own essay, I, I mix genres. So uh, there's part memoir and there's part uh, fictional uh, work on gender and gender fluidity, which uh, is a subject that I want to address because um, it doesn't uh, often come into the realm of mainstream, mainstream writing, but I think it's very much, uh, much more present than we acknowledge. So I'm going to read a little bit from that. The uh, essay is called She Generis, Shapeshifting Across the River of Desire. But I'll start with a quote from uh, Sri Husvit. Identities, identifications, and desires cannot be untangled from one another. We become ourselves through others, and the self is a porous thing, not a, sal not a sealed container. That's from a work of hers called My Father and Myself. So here we go. Mohini's painting work, influenced by the abstract action painters, notably Franz Klein, manifested a muscular masculinity. And since she never signed her canvases, viewers in galleries usually assumed the work was by a man. It was this very forceful quality of the work that was attractive, but also other gender-related incongruities of the painter herself, whom she <coughs> met when she purchased a painting. Mohini's abundant hair was bound in an enormous bun held together by a hair clip fitted with massive cloth flowers. She wore tight-fitting jeans, a kurta, closed, boot-like shoes, unusual footwear for tropical Goa. Her facial features were fine, feminine, her voice husky. She spoke in an oddly sophisticated yet antiqu antiqu antiquated language. The overall effect, a hot but slightly dikey librarian type. They met a few times after that for coffee or a meal. They discussed painting, ideas, books. They discovered they had almost identical bookshelves. They talked for hours on the phone. It was mostly Mohini who initiated the calls. She was surprised when she discovered Mohini's high level of dependency on the men in her life, her father, her husband, male lover in a political power position, a youngish man with an obvious mother complex. Mohini had never balanced her own checkbook. Her husband, with whom she hadn't shared a sexual relationship in decades, traveled extensively on business. On one of those trips, Mohini asked her new friend to spend the night. They talked late, well beyond the witching hour. Finally, they fell asleep in the same room on separate mattresses they had spread on the floor. Early in the morning, Mohini reached out, kissed her hands, and said, I've never met anyone like you. May I touch you? It was, not, it was not the first time a woman had asked, but it was the first time she had said yes. And she continued to say yes for another year. In this essay, I'm 
I'm not going to read through the whole, whole thing, but I want to read towards the end where um, I discuss the leveling of the playing field between genders that, you know, whether you're with a man or a woman or a transgender person or uh, whomever it may be, um, the end of desire is the end of the desire and it affects everybody uh, equally. In the morning, Mohini came into the TV room, so this is one year later, where she was watching an art film, handed her a plate of eggs and toast and said, I don't want to sleep with you anymore. It's not working for me, this intimacy. She stared at Mohini incredulously. But you're still responding to me sexually, she said. That's just the proximity, Mohini said. She said, can't we discuss it? No, Mohini said, it's not working for me. Mohini kept repeating, like John Malkovich in Dangerous Liaisons, telling Michelle Pfeiffer over and over again, it's beyond my control. So this is the leveling of the gender playing field, just as with the end of any other love affair, when the beloved has intimacy issues and withdraws love, it is the end of the desire. The world is shattered for the one rejected. Desire is finite. Um, I have another work in progress, which is a collection of poetry called This is How You Fix What is Broken. And uh, I want to be brief because I'm pretty excited about Rosalind reading from her work. I had the uh, benefit of uh, reading a few chapters before when she was working on it, so I'm not going to hog the mic. <laughs> this is called Desire. You stranger. I know you toy with the idea of killing me. And then I think of ancient priests, different denominations, carrying gods like alms in their pockets or around their necks, August sovereigns, coins with faces. This August is blue. I sleep with the sapphire under my pillow for insurance. If the judges cannot, who will make abdication speak? You call me stranger, to tongue, to mind, to my own land, my own body. I have known such serial killers in another life, those colluding glances, exchanged, intercepting, even the trees, not only the bodies of the poets. Thank you. Hello, yeah, this is much better. I can actually see everyone. Um, this is a very in, important moment for me because it's just been like 10 minutes and I'm holding my book for the first time. Uh, so this is quite historic. <laughs> and I'm really thankful for all of you who are here. I feel like there's this, it's been imprinted in my mind now, this, you know, the scene, this audience, it's going to be special for the rest of my life. <laughs> Um, so I've worked on this book for six years, uh, and uh, it's been seven years, you know, if you count the year in production. It's called A Handbook for My Lover. It's non-fiction, um, erotic, um, and it's based, on a, it's based on or it documents six years in the life of my relationship with uh, a, photo a photographer who was also twice my age. Um, which made it very interesting and overwhelming and beautiful and terrifying, all of it at the same time. So this book essentially uh, documents our everyday moments, everyday uh, conversations, but it also kind of chronicles uh, the, the lifespan of our passion. And I'm happy to report that our relationship survived this scrutiny and we're still together. So um, since this, this panel is really about, you know, transgression and desire, I'm going to be kind of brave and a little bit shameless. Um, and I'm going to read my chapter uh, called The M Word. It's not a very long chapter. It's just like two pages. And it's a chapter on masturbation. Um, and I hope you'll bear with me and not file an FIR against me. <laughs> I would appreciate that very much. Okay. The M word. 
One summer morning during our first year together, I woke up to find your moist body glued to mine. The night had been sultry, I'd shorn off all extraneous layers, had shed my clothes hours before, so when I woke up, my black body was reflecting light. Half awake, half asleep, still lost in dreams, your fingers wandered across my body like pilgrims in search of the promised land, finally arriving at the threshold of my cunt. You lost the battle against sleep. Your now limp fingers bore witness to this defeat. They floated in the wet of my spill. I saved them from drowning. I taught them how to swim, how to tread the water's depth and stay afloat. I surprised you with my gesture, rescued you from the snares of sleep. You drew closer, buried your lips in the warm cove where my neck meets my shoulder. I continued to walk your fingers through worlds buried under sea, submerged hallways and ancient palaces. You cast away my grip so your fingers could voyage independently. You traveled through desolate routes, went in circles but refused to stop, to stop and seek instruction. You ambled your way into hidden continents until you finally arrived at the core of my second heart and tampered with its pulse. You held me as I released that final ounce of breath that would bring me back to the sun-curled morning. We lay in the speechless afterglow of that self-effacing moment, your arms encasing me, your mouth drawing in the air from mine as if encroaching on the privacy of my pleasure. Then, candidly, you opened your mouth, rippling the texture of the stillness. What do you think about when you masturbate? I remember clearly how you uttered the taboo word, with a stress on the first and last syllable. What I forget is my reply. It must have been too incoherent. I must have been surprised by the forwardness of your question. I wasn't sure if it was designed to invade the secrecy of my fantasies or if it stemmed from your desire for knowledge that was otherwise forbidden. Later, so I could offer you an answer worthy of your intrusiveness, I sought out the origin of the word and found it was inherently deviant. Manus to pare, to defile with the hand. I defile myself regularly. There are days when all I do is lie in bed and defile myself. Imagine the stark contrast of my ebony fingers nudging against the haughty pink of my cunt. The dialogue I conduct between skin and flesh. The reaching into my cavernous core. The time spent in shameless combustions. The momentary quenching of an eternal thirst. My fingers serve me best. They're dexterous and adventurous. They know and love the texture of my cunt, the soft, smooth edges of my labia, my perky, elated clit. They know of secret entrances, of shortcuts and escape hatches, of passageways that lead to buried treasure. They are high priests in this holy crown, my sanctum sanctorum. There, there are days when I drip despite myself as if writhing in silent ecstasy. I wake up wanting and cannot shake away the urge to defile myself. My feet guide my body through the restless world of the living, but my thoughts lie suspended in some other ethereal realm. I drip until I start to spill. My nipples are alert and graze against the fabric of my clothes. My pores are receptive to every slight brush of wind. I am all cunt, all receptacle, all slush. On days like these, it is nature that seduces me with her wild scent of laburnum or chameli, or the silly feel of her grass against my bare feet, the fleeting banter of hedonistic pigeons making love in thin air, the cantankerous laughter of fresh green leaves. I participate in this world outside my body. My surface exterior is deceptively calm. No one would know of the scent of wet earth newly born in my cunt. I tease myself, I continue the charade. I let the spill build into a flood until I can no longer wait, until I must hurry to my bed and tend to my hysteria. 
I use the first three fingers of my right hand, the ones I used to write. My thumb waits outside by the brink for fear of drowning. My index finger and the tallest one begin to trace circles outside the mouth of my gun. An orgasm is a tangible thrill. Imagine it as clay slowly slipping into being, guided by the contours of fingers held against the sleek, sizzling spin of a potter's wheel. The dizzy circumference churning mud. There is shape-shifting, a delicate rise and fall until the walls evolve, until the reliefs acquire definition, sweeping curves, measured lilt. The peak is that immediate moment when the pot is suddenly complete and is separated from the wheel. Left over are sighs, then the opening of eyes, the curling of toes, the clasping together of thighs, the return from wonderland. Often I read, I lie in bed, let loose my hair, unfasten my clothes, hold a book a few inches from my face and begin to swallow words. I don't stop to chew. I let them slide along my throat into my belly so they can enter my blood and course through me. I read Nin and Vinterson, Miller and Carson, Angela Carter's Black Venus, Michael Ondantier's Cinnamon Peeler, you could never walk through markets without the profession of my fingers floating over you. Or recipes by Miss Lawson, or by Laura Esquivel, or Gertrude Stein, who has this to say of roast beef. In the inside there is sleeping, in the outside there is reddening, in the morning there is meaning, in the evening there is feeling. Please beef, please beef, pleasure is not wailing. Please beef, please be carved clear, Please be a case of consideration. And of salad dressing and an artichoke. Place pale hot, please cover rose. Please acre in the red stranger. Please butter all the beefsteak with regular field faces. Words are aphrodisiacs. They evoke the smell and feel of the substances they suggest. They tempt and leer with their promise of tangible things and of worlds outside of my reach. They inflict me with lust. They fill me with want. Words become substitutes for your touch. I'm going to end there. There's more, but I think I'd rather you read it yourself. Thank you. Uh, have I lost my mic? Okay, it's here. Do we have? Uh, yeah. I hope we we can get coffees today. Well, I can't wait. I might not even go anywhere. I might just stay here in my room. <laughs> there are just 20 uh, advanced copies. The book is only formally releasing in a couple of weeks, but it's available for, for pre-order on Amazon at a very good discount. <laughs> but I think there are about 20 copies um, in the bookstore here at HarperCollins. Uh, that's the publisher. Okay, yeah. wonderful. And when is your book out? Uh, so, uh, has yours been released already? No, no. It's it's my book is called Ero Text. I love that. Um, e capital R O T capital E X T. Uh, it's uh, being bought out by uh, Penguin uh, Penguin Random House at the JLF, I think, January. So I'm looking at the oh. proofs and feeling rather nervous. So it's 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 there. It's almost there. Well, a lot to look forward in our area of writing. Yes. Clearly. I want. I um. I do want to, uh, since we seem to be in a festival that you know is uh, much less uh, cynical and jaded than many that I've been to, and uh, much more open, and at least in the kinds of discussions that I've seen for so in the past two days. Um, I'd like to discuss with either of you or both of you. Um, how you feel, uh, in, in India we have certain laws that will apply to obscenity, and both of you made reference, I mean, you spoke about Sudeep, you know, you hope Modi will not chop your head off, and you hope that nobody will file an FIR, and I think we all hope that. The fact that we even say it, um, I'd like to know from both of you, and then maybe I'll have my say about it, but, uh, how you feel and whether uh, the, such laws uh, you think about how those laws might affect you or whether they do affect you or whether you would uh, feel 
somewhat less comfortable writing uh, the way you would ordinarily write in, a, in the climate that we are in today? Um, I think uh, the, the whole thing about obscenity is kind of, it was definitely frightening to me when I was, uh, when I was signing my contract with Random House, with, uh, sorry, with HarperCollins. Um, I spent a lot of time speaking to lawyer friends of mine, trying to understand what could possibly happen, what could possibly, what people could possibly claim I was doing, or could the book be seen as offensive, could the book be, just now as I was reading it, and I was reading that small passage from Gertrude Stein, and it says, please beef, please be the beef, yes. and I suddenly, it <laughs> occurred to me that, <laughs> that we're living in this sort of beef ban climate, and it is actually really, it is a bit scary, and, and I do have conversations uh, with my close friends and my partner about what could possibly happen, just so that one can be uh, ready and prepared to deal with it. Uh, but I think at every point while I was writing this book, I decided that I would not allow them, you know, the luxury of, or the privilege of having me self-censor my writing. I think if the moment we start to self-censor and stop ourselves from being honest, from articulating ourselves, they won and we've lost. Yeah, I also feel that it's speech. a bit like jumping off a cliff and you have yeah. to just decide, decide because we all do have these obscenity clauses in our contracts yeah. and the law itself is so vague, it's like, uh, I mean, what defines obscenity is not defined in the law, so anything can, can go. What about you, Sudeep? So, um, I mean, we have some people here who I admire a lot who have returned their awards, for instance, or resigned from their posts. And uh, it's very, very important as a gesture that they've done it. And uh, the fact that it's actually now taken on this whole uh, sort of uh, almost a revolution, quiet revolution-like thing. My way of doing it and our way of doing it, I suspect, is to write it out. It's so, so important to actually write out whatever we feel and think, as long as we're not harming someone. I mean, there's, there's a fine line between creative expression and uh, being uh, disgusting or offensive, that's a, that's a different side yeah, of the story. Yeah, that's another thing we should talk but, about. But uh, yeah, we should talk about that as well. But I think uh, as artists, as writers, we must, must actually um, uphold free speech as we all do. Um, I was also reading through the fine print of the contract. First of all, I couldn't figure it out because the contracts are so thick and, you know, it's so jargonized. Um, but I just, uh, but I showed it to the lawyer and again, the laws in India about obscenity and uh, sexuality are extremely, extremely vague. and extremely vague. And they are mostly, I don't know who wrote them, but I don't know how many women are on the panel who write these. You know, so it's a question of how you interpret it. And also, I suspect when these laws are written, it should be uh, written ideally in the ideal world where we are talking about gender in, in the widest possible span. So not just male and female not just have men and women on the board, but also lesbians and transgenders and all sorts of things, because you know that is what the reality and the truth is. I mean, how much can we hide and shove under the carpet, really? I find it really interesting that you know a, a country as progressive a, a, as India that has legislated a third gender um, is at the, simultaneously you know, seeming to go uh, so regressively. No, you know, I think it's important not to generalize. It's not India that is doing it. There yeah, are parts I, yeah, of India. There are parts India, of India. But I mean, we as Indians feel very uncomfortable with all the lot of things that are happening. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I, I just take it in a very comical sense. I mean, because Indian, India legisla legislates uh, that there's a third gender, it's very much in tune with the Sanskrit grammar. We have a neuter gender, male gender, so they want to form that particular arc. But that aside, you know, uh, um, um, I mean, look at, look at, there are so many people walking down the streets who are criminals because they are gays, even, even now. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a particular kind of strain of India that is problematic. If, for instance, uh, Hinduism is under attack, not because Hinduism is what it is, it's the Hindutva aspect the misleading yeah, Hindutva aspect of Hinduism, yeah. which is creating a lot of the problems. Most of the time when these people are talking about, and whoever these people are, they haven't even read the text. 
I mean, what are they talking about? So, you know, you have to sort of keep a distance and sort of respond to it in a kind of calm and quiet way. But and, would uh, you say that you might feel a little more circumspect about what you put out there or even what we no, might not say at all. here? Not Nothing. at all. Not at all. I mean, you know, if I do that, I'll stop breathing. Uh, because, and as you said very rightly so, if we start censoring ourselves, then they've won. I mean, it's an easy thing, you know. But the important thing is to be graceful about it. If you're writing, like you wrote your MP, uh, thing, it's just beautifully and gracefully it's written. Stunning. You know, erotic writing is, is one of those peculiar things where you're on the razor edge. If you, if you push it too much, <laughs> then it gets into the pea space. Yeah. If you undercook it, then it becomes like soppy, sentimental, love, lost sort of stuff, which we've done in school. How do you skate on that line? You have Sappho, you have Anne Carson, Gertrude Stein. You know, the, the, the Brahmanujan has done such fabulous uh, translations of some of the Tamil uh, Sangam poets. That's high class erotica, where, where nothing is said, but everything is said, or you say everything, but nothing is said. I'm actually of the opinion that the, there is no good erotica and bad erotica. In my opinion, erotica is kind of like the pinnacle of good writing. Because yes. It, <laughs> I think it's the kind of thing where uh, you, you, you're trying to use words to touch someone, and and you want whoever's reading what you've written to feel like they've been touched, like they've been yeah. caressed. Like they, I, I feel like you want there to be a very visceral reaction. And you want them to feel aroused. You don't want them to jerk off. Now. That's right. You know that's what I mean? Right. Yeah. And I think that's... And that's, that's yeah. just so important. And I think actually, I was actually, uh, I've been re I mean, I read a lot of uh, young fiction uh, um, and poetry written by Indians. And a couple of my recent examples, which I actually thought were good, brave writing, was, uh, say, uh, Deepthi Kapoor's bad character. I think she handles sex extremely well, very stylishly and in a very kind of cosmopolitan way. Uh, there was a story, short story, I think, in uh, Palash Merotra's book of short stories, which uh, talks about an afternoon stolen in Defense Colony flat. It was real. You know, there was the guy downstairs, you know, beating the drum. I mean, you know, that is what... The, 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 as we said, that you know, if you're starting to be afraid of a certain kind of writing, then we're lost. You know. Yeah. Even though, I mean, I would consider myself a feminist, or maybe I, I don't, you know, womanist or something. Um, I, I think we're moving down a very slippery slope. The moment we try to to define uh, what is pornography and what is yeah, I, erotic literature, uh, so I'm uh, personally, I feel that. Let everybody <laughs> write as they please and uh, let the readers and the reviewers determine uh, its merit. It's also a very, very, uh, it's a product of the time. I mean, we are re living in very regressive times. Um, if you read Roman <laughs> literature, you know, it's all. But I, I'm, she's waving to us, and I think we have to open it up to uh, questions. Oh, okay. So it's very please. disconcerting to get questions yeah, when can't you can't see. see. <laughs> it's this but sort of yes. dark, womb-like space. <laughs> but please, go ahead. Just to get the discussion started, uh, since the theme touched upon the motives of transgression and desire, so this is addressed to the entire panel. To what extent do you see the act of writing uh, about desire as an act which is consciously transgressive? I mean, is there a risk in being consciously transgressive? Insofar as, yes, the times may be regressive, as was pointed out, the situation which uh, may face the individual writer in terms of actual consequences may be actually uh, quite scary to contemplate if you begin thinking about that. But is writing, especially about erotic matters, something which sort of comes from a place deep within every sense of the term? Or is it sort of sometimes consciously trying to push a boundary in order to make a certain kind of statement? I mean, the question I'm asking really is about agendas in erotic literature in particular. How useful or to what extent is the writing motivated by agendas? Thank you. I I think that whatever kind of writing uh, I'm doing, speaking for myself, 
um, I'm trying to push boundaries. But in particular, when I am uh, uh, dealing with erotica, whether it's in uh, a novel form or a memoir form, which is the hardest, I would say, uh, uh, the most difficult to push those boundaries because you're much more exposed than you are if you're uh, writing a poem or writing a part, it's part of your novel. Um, but that said, I would, I would say I would not, uh, I know that I am pushing boundaries, whether I'm writing that or whether I'm writing erotica, pure erotica, but I'm not conscious of it when I'm writing it. When I'm writing, I just try to just write straight through. Um, I think the consciousness comes for me when I go back to edit. And when I'm editing, I'm wearing a completely different hat. And then I will look at it more in terms of what it, whether it sounds uh, authentic or not. You actually mentioned a couple of things. I mean, I think, uh, um, to me, this the erotic writing comes from a very intimate space. And I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, there is no agenda. Um, erotica is only one shade of the lot of things we do. Um, and it's a valid shade, as we all, uh, as you can see. Because it's intimate, it's actually quite hard to do it properly, you know. Um, so in fact, you don't self-censor uh, censor yourself so much, but you're actually just wondering. So in fact, some of the poems I read, you know, I don't know whether I can read it in front of, in front of my mom. I can read it in front of my, in front of strangers and you know uh, friends. But because of that kind of strange uh, dance we do of the ritual of so social living, which where we have masks and so on and so forth. But certainly, as far as I'm concerned, it's a very very intimate space. It's important to, uh, for it to be there. And if it fits the book, it should be there. A, a bad example would be in a film. Do you, have, do you need to have a sex, sex scene? Is this gratuitous? Or is it part of the narrative of the story? If it is part of the narrative of the story, it needs to be there, normally as human beings act and feel. Um, I'd also distinguish between writing a sex scene and writing about desire. And I would say that, I mean, Rosalind's work, what she just read is a perfect example of, of that. Because you get carried away by the, by the beauty and the sensuality of the language. And uh, what we all aspire to as writers, whether we're writing erotica or otherwise, is a certain transcendence, I would say. Yep. I actually, uh, I really liked your question because it's something that I've very consciously thought about over many years. And I have a certain kind of canon of writers, you know, who have been reading for this book. And I realized that to me, the idea of writing something that was erotic, that was consciously erotic, was a very political uh, gesture. And I actually do think uh, there's this amazing writer who wrote a book uh, in the 90s. Uh, it's actually called I Love Dick. Um, it's, about, uh, it, it's about her obsession with a, liter a cultural theorist whose name is Dick. Um, and she just says somewhere in that book, that one of the most, I can't remember it like verbatim, but is, she says, female irrepressibility. Writing female irrepressibility is the biggest political statement. It's the most significant thing that women can do. Uh, and so I realized that choosing to write about the body, choosing to write about the self, choosing to write into the body and into the self I thought it could actually be a very subversive space because what it meant was to take control of the narrative, to, to be in charge of your own gospel, to you know, proselytize your own uh, lust, and to, not, to, to speak of your shame, but not to be ashamed of it. Uh, so I really think, for me, that there was a very clear agenda. And I wouldn't hesitate to say that my book is political in that the personal is political. And I think as a woman, the personal will always be political, whether you call yourself a feminist or not. So, yeah. I would concur with that insofar, insofar as my current 
work on gender. I don't think earlier when uh, earlier I would have. I don't think earlier I would have uh, consciously thought of any of my work as a political act, but I would consider the current work that I'm doing now on gender and cross-gender, gender fluidity, and uh, perceptions of the other, which often takes a uh, um, erotic form. I definitely I would concur with you that that I would consider a political act but I still do the writing first and then I consider what uh, I mean being a political act it doesn't influence the actual process of the writing for me yeah I mean you know I mean I would concur as well and there are, there are, there are clearly two sides uh, one is the writing of it and one is the critiquing of it so the critiquing of it is an academic thing um, and it's important that we have those tools to 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 analyze the writing but if you start being self-critical first, then the writing wouldn't happen. Right. You just have to let it flow. Um, it's a very different process. Writers and artists understand that. Academics may or may not understand that. But both are important as, 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 as uh, and they kind of are two ends of the same, two ends of the fulcrum. And it's a question of how you move the fulcrum and the weight will change and so on. So. Uh, Every act, even the fact that we are speaking, is political. I mean, how can it not be? But if it becomes an agenda, then you know, your writing will change. And, it's, it, and that's fine too. Then you can write reportage, you can write a paper, and so on. But as creative writers, I think you know, we occupy a different space. And also for us, clearly, if you hear the uh, texts we have written, the lyricism and beauty and the evanescence of the time and space of erotic space is very, very important. You need white spaces. You need the space to feel. You need the space to think through it. And words are used in a way that allows you to string that kind of garland. And that's important. I think we're running out of time. Do we have any time for more questions, or that's it? OK. Thank you very Thank much you very for much. being here. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much. My sincerest apologies for not being able to take more questions. We are just absolutely running out of time and it's time for our next session. However, our writers will be here and uh, should you want to have a conversation, they, you can meet them uh, right off the amphitheater.